is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk, as we continue on in our ongoing study of the letter of James. Uh, today, I think, is our 15th or 16th, 16th part. 16th, 16th part, yeah. Uh, and we're in the middle of the fifth chapter, so we're progressing towards the end right now. Slowly but surely. Slowly but surely. <laughs> so you'll want to have your Bibles and maybe a, a pen and a pencil and notepad so you can take jot down some notes. And don't forget you can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you, find out where you're listening from, and we, any comments or questions we're, we're happy to receive. Amen. All right, so we're going to pick up in James chapter 5, starting at verse 16, right after Alice asks for the Lord's blessing on this time together. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you, we praise you, we thank you. And Lord, we ask that the word that goes forth tonight goes into our hearts and comes out of our mouths Amen. and touches other lives and changes hearts. We just don't want to speak anything on our own, Lord, and we just want to do what you command us to do. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. And uh, we left off last week, last week talking about, because James is talking about sickness and mm -hmm. happiness. Joyful. Cheerful. Cheerful. Your suffering right. isn't cheerful. So, yeah, and so now in 5.16, let me read 5.16. Now I'm reading from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. And James says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can avail it much. Well, I'm going to take issue with that translation a little bit. The simple fact of the matter is where it says, confess your sins, in the King James it says, confess your faults. And the simple fact of the matter is because James talks about sin quite a bit in his letter. Mm -hmm. And each and every time he talks about sin, he uses a very different Greek word than he's using here in this, in this verse. Okay. So, to be precise, there's a difference between faults and sin, all right? If we confess our sins, it says, He is faithful and righteous to forgive, our, uh, forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. That's what John wrote in 1 John chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. What's the difference between a sin and a fault? Well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, because even in the letter of James here, uh, in chapter 1, verse 15, chapter 2, verse 9, chapter 4, verse 8 and 17, and here in chapter 5 and 15, but in verse 20, but not in 15 and 16, mm -hmm. he uses an entirely different word that literally means sin, right? Well, you know, Alice and I lived in and ministered in for quite a while in California, which is pretty well known for its fault lines. Yes. And by the way, it's not the only place in the United States that has fault lines by any means. As a matter of fact, we lived in uh, New York City in Westchester County in New York, and there is a nuclear power plant called the Indian River Power Plant on the Hudson River, which sits right over a fault line. That's good planning. That's the government for you. And in Tennessee, there are quite a number of massive fault lines. Now, what is a fault line? I am not a scientist, but I will tell you this. It's a place where there is weakness in the structure that has a proclivity towards problems and an earthquake. I mean, you know, we were in California when the North, uh, North Ridge mm -hmm. uh, uh, fault broke loose. And I mean, you were there right after. And there, were massive, there was massive, massive destruction in the Los Angeles area and, and just north of it. Because the crack followed, I mean, the quake followed the fall line, right? Mm -hmm. So if you think of fall as kind of like a weakness and a propensity for problems, then think, are we not, do we not have weaknesses in our life? Absolutely. And are we not prone and susceptible to fault, fault to sin? Mm -hmm. Okay, we're, we're susceptible to sin. 
But until that time, there's just a fault there. Right. We there's a maybe it's a subtle difference, but there is a difference between a fault and a sin. And I think it's important because you know God has purpose in what He says. So if you use a different word here, you know, speaking through James, if you use a different word for fault than than sin, there's got to be a reason for it, right? And I'm saying that I believe it's about a fault line or fault is a weakness. And when we're prone to and susceptible to to sin, that would lead to sin. Lead to sin, right? So fault lines are constantly monitored, watched, and guarded. Mm -hmm. We need to guard ourselves right. against sin. Right. The, the, that the fault that exists in us. And by the way, that's our human. That's our fallen human nature. I mean, that's, that is the inheritance of the world. Right. Because Adam sinned, you know. So let me say here, confess our weaknesses to one another and pray for one another. Because that's what we need. I mean, you know, we all have weaknesses, spiritual weaknesses, yes, yeah. that make us open to potential sin. sin. That and can we, lead to sin. Right. So we, that that's, what, sin. that's why we need to be praying for one another that that doesn't happen, mm -hmm. doesn't occur. You're going to have weakness in you. Yes. I mean, we are we are still in the flesh. Mm -hmm. We are spiritual beings mm -hmm. walking around in the flesh. You know, when Adam and Eve sinned, think about this. I want to read from Genesis 3, 8. It says that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves. You want to know why sin separates you from God? Because you'll run and hide. Mm. And then in Isaiah 59, 1, 2, this, this certainly makes it clear. Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor is his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's the danger of sin. It separates us from God. Why? Because we're not because He's going to leave us. He said, "I'll never leave you, nor forsake you." But when we sin, we will have a tendency to run away and hide from God. We right? leave Him, and that's because our fallen human nature demands that we hide from God. Right. We don't want Him to see our failures, our falling, our failings. Well, that's our pride too, because we don't want other people to see our failings. No, absolutely not. We don't. So we, we would, that's our human nature, is to hide any weakness or sin in our life. Absolutely. And the idea of confessing your sin to somebody, that's not scriptural. No. We confess our sins to God, only God. Well, you know, as a matter of fact, I was going to read a scripture about that, wasn't I? Um, because... And Alice is right. It's, it is. It's about pride. Pride is like a plaque. Yes. That, that stems the flow of life in the body, the body, also the church, right? And the the goal here is that we would be healed. But remember that David said, "When I kept silent about my sin, mm. my body wasted away through my groaning all day long." And you might as well confess it because there is nothing covered up that will not be revealed right. and hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, what you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you have whispered in the inner room shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Luke 12, 2 and 3. Mm -hmm. So, you know, why bother trying to hide it? It's, it's going to be revealed. It's going to be shown. Okay? Therefore, do not lose heart. But though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. 2 Corinthians 4.16 Listen, our flesh is dying. Mm -hmm. And God made no promise to save your flesh. I mean, the, the, this is the truth. That flesh is destined to die because the, the perishable cannot inherit the imperishable. That's right. So don't worry about your flesh. I mean, what you have to focus on is your spirit. Remember that Paul said in Romans, Romans 6, 23, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Amen. You're destined to eternal life. Okay? That's his promise. That, that is his promise, all right? So I'm going to go on. I want to read verses 17 and 18, 18 in that fifth chapter. Talking about Elijah. I, I, before I start, I just want to tell you, when I first read about Elijah, and I'm talking about many, 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 many years ago, I thought, whoa, this, this, this guy, there's something supernatural about him. And the simple fact is that there's nothing supernatural about him. There's something just spiritual about him, right? And it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. Now, Elijah, it says, was a man with a nature like ours. The King James says, a man subject to like passions as we are, right? But in 1 Kings 19, verse 4, it says, talking about him, he said, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough now, O Lord. Take my life, for I am not better than my father's. This is after he had this incredible experience on top of Mount Carmel, right. where he faced and challenged the people of God to face and challenge the, the pagans mm -hmm. who were being supported by the king and queen of Israel at the time, Ahaz and Jezebel. He was being hunted down. He, absolutely. So he became very conscious of his mortality, of yeah. his flesh, right? Mm -hmm. But it talks about, now we were talking about Elijah, and it says, who stood. He stood in, not just visited, the presence of God. Mm. In 1 Kings 17, 1, it says, Now the Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain for in three years, Except by my word. He said, the Lord God of Israel, before whom I stand. That's the same thing that Gabriel said, right? Yes. When he came and announced the, the birth of Jesus. I am Gabriel who stands and in the presence John of God. God. He said, the angel answered him, Zacharias, and said, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. And I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Luke 1.19 Maybe our prayers are not as powerful as they should be because we just visit God. Right, why not? Instead of standing in... We, we visit him once in a while rather than standing in his presence. Elijah, that troubler of Israel, as King Ahab called him, had made up his mind and decided... So it says in 1821, 1 Kings 18:21, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you hesitate between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people did not answer him a word. Are you ready to answer that question? So he continues on, and in chapter 19, verse 14 of that 1 Kings, Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord. The God of hosts and the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Well, the fact of the matter is he wasn't alone. He not alone was left, but there were so few that he didn't know that, right? right. Elijah was hot for the Lord. I mean, he, he was on fire for the Lord. That's right. That's why he had no trouble calling fire down from heaven on that altar, right? And he believed. You bet you he believed. So in Revelation 3.15, talking about being hot for the Lord, God says to, to the church of Laodicea, He said, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. Right? Elijah prayed earnestly. Now, I'm going to say this. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm going to talk about the power of prayer. Okay. There is no such thing. God is the power. Prayer is the connection. Right. The power is not in your prayer. The, the power is in your God. 
but you are connected to him by prayer. So be on guard against the pride that credits your prayer rather than your God. Amen. I'll say that one more time and think about this. Be on guard against the pride that will give credit to your prayer rather than to your God. Think about what Jesus said in the end of Matthew chapter 7 about many of his disciples who come to him on that last day saying, Lord, Lord, look what we did in your name. And he said, depart me from me, you evil ones. I never knew you. Elijah did not pray casually. He prayed prayer. Now that may sound funny. But that's exactly what it says in the Hebrew. It doesn't say he prayed earnestly. It says he prayed prayer. Like Jesus. Did he pray like Jesus? He, Jesus, withdrew from the apostles, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Now an angel from heaven appeared to him, strengthening him, and being in agony, he was praying very fervently, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down on the ground. Luke 20, 22, that was verses 41 to 44. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans and said, we don't know how to pray as we should. Like I said, Jesus prayed prayer. That's what it says. He prayed fervently. Listen in the quiet and stillness of that evening in the garden. Could you hear the drops of his blood falling upon the ground? Do we really begin to understand fervent prayer? We do. We get. I mean, I have to confess that. That when uh, you, someone asks you to pray for them, and you pray, and then their, their prayer is, you know, whatever their request is, God has dealt with it and handled it. And, you've, and I know I felt, well, that was because I prayed for them. And I felt puffed up and proud, not realizing it until this study. Well, it's true. It's you can get very proud in praying. The effect of prayer of a righteous man availed much. That's because you're connected to God. Right. It's God who does it. Yeah, it's God in which in whom resides all the power. Right? And I'll, I'll say that again. It's not your prayer that has the power. It's your God that has the power. Amen. It's our prayer that connects us to our God. Alright? So, but... It says, this is the, I'm reading a verse here from 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5, 14. We have to learn to pray in God's will, not our own. That's right. Okay? Having said that, I don't know if you've ever heard me say this, remember Ramah, right? Yes. It says in Ramah, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you have grown old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king for us to judge us like all the nations. They wanted to be like the world. And God said to Samuel, the prophet, Listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, Go every man to his city. And then God would say to Samuel, They have not rejected you. They have rejected me as being king over them. That's right. The, the great danger is that you'll pray something and God will give it to you. Yes. When it's not his will. And that is a great danger. And that's the kind of weakness that we have in our flesh. That, oh boy, we'll get all excited. No. Our, our prayer all the time has to be, the, the foundation of our prayer has to be that we be like Jesus. That we have the mind of Christ. That we have the same attitude in us that was in Christ Jesus. That we are always seeking the will of the Father. Because that's what Jesus did, right? Now Paul prayed a prayer, and God answered him. And the answer was, no. No. He says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. 
Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9. I and mean, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Are you looking to do God's will or are you looking for God to do your will? When you said it, you talked about that, that last uh, verse about being perfected in weakness, God is power. And that's what you were saying. The power of prayer. God is the power. God is the power. So it's, it's the same thing that like John the Baptist was saying. He must increase, I must, must decrease. decrease. In absolutely everything. I mean, there's so much that attests to this. Yeah. We, we have to, it should be obvious to us, but it doesn't seem to be, at least all the time. You know, the, the effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. We just talked about that. Mm -hmm. What's the effective prayer? To pray God's yes. will. I mean, I will be done. It says it in Philippians. Have the same mind, the same attitude you that was in Christ Jesus. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We have to learn the desire to be like Jesus, always seeking the will of the Father. And then you'll find out that you have a mighty, mighty powerful prayer life. Okay. It says about Elijah that it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. That's because of his prayer. But his prayer was because that was God's will, right? Man's sin caused, again, by the way, look in Genesis 3.17, caused the Lord to curse the earth. The problem is not cows passing gas no. or cars getting poor mileage. No. That's not the problem. It is being taught that God does not do the type, that type of thing today because of grace. That's why James said earlier, let not many of you become teachers because so many out there who do not have a clue about the nature of God, are teaching about prayer. Amen. God doesn't change. It says that in Psalm 55, 19, Hebrews 13, 8. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't seem like mankind changes very much either. It says in Jeremiah 51, 17, all mankind is stupid, devoid of knowledge. Every goldsmith is put to shame by his idols. For his molten images are deceitful, and there's no breath in them. You know, there there is or was a show, I don't know, which I, I've never actually seen the show. Are you smarter than a fifth grader? Mm -hmm. Right? I, I, yeah, I, there was a show. But I've never seen it either. I think that's what the name of it was. Yeah. The question the man needs, not to be, are you smarter than a fifth grader? The question the man is, are you smarter than a turnip? <laughs> or uh, an artichoke or a tree or something? For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Romans 8.22. So consider this. As he was now approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees and the multitude said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered and said, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. The trees are going to clap their hands when Jesus comes back. So it says, So shall my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, empty, without accomplishing what I desire, and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you will go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. Isaiah 55, 11, and there it is. The trees of the field are going to clap their hands. Hallelujah. One more. Okay, I want to read to you Psalms 96, verses 11 to 13. Let the heavens be glad. Let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that it contains. Let the field exult in all that is in it. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming. 
For he is coming to judge you. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. This is what we have to look forward to. What an amazing time. What an amazing place. What an amazing thing to be a child of God who has been given the Holy Spirit to give us the power to do exactly that. To seek and to do the will of God. Do not be led astray because of your weakness. Because of that fault line that goes through man ever since the sin of Adam in the garden. That we have a desire to have our will. No. Let us always seek God's will. And you'll always be blessed, I promise you. Well, that went quick, I'm sorry. Yes, it did. There's more. There's so much more. There's so much more. But, but remember this. I mean, remember that our Father loves us. I mean, it's all, it all boils down to the love of God in our lives. It's an incredible. We don't know how to pray as we should. But if we know that He loves us, if we know that He loves us so much, that he put his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, on a cross in our place. Well, you know, it says that love will cast out fear. That's right. Perfect love casts yes. out fear, and his love is perfect. So fear not. I know these are rough times. Fear not. Trust in the Lord your God. Yes. Trust in the Lord your Father who loves you immeasurably. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your love. We thank you for your peace. Yes. We thank you for your joy. We thank you for all the fruit of your Holy Spirit that you've placed in our lives. Lord, help us to be faithful witnesses of that love. Help us to communicate that love to others. Help us to bring that good news to a world that is so filled with bad news. Help us to bring your light into a world that is so filled with darkness, Lord God, that other lives may be touched. We praise you and thank you that you can use us in all of our weakness, in all of our humanity, Lord, that you can use us for the glory of your name. Jesus. So we praise you and thank you. Hallelujah. Well, until next week, may the Lord our God bless you and manifest himself in your life and through your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye.